We make a flight plan before a flight to make sure we know what we're going to do. This way we can check our navigation, our fuel burn and make sure we follow any rules and procedures that might apply to our routing. But how do air traffic control know what we're going to do? Well, let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the 10th and final class in the flight planning series. Today we're going to be having a look at ICAO flight plans. ICAO standing for the International Civil Aviation Organization. ICAO flight plans are things that we send in to a central air traffic control system so that they know what we're about to do. This way they can manage and monitor flights through certain airspace more effectively and it's better for everybody involved in using that airspace. Most commercial flights are planned to operate within controlled airspace at some point. If this is the case, a flight plan will be required. A flight plan helps air traffic control to plan and coordinate flights through busy airspace and it also helps in the case of an accident. If central control knows you were planning this route via these waypoints, then likely when you landed in a field and declared an emergency, it's going to be in the area of those waypoints. It's not going to be too far off that route. Flight plans can be submitted for VFR or IFR flights and its primar primary use is primarily used for this coordination in case of um, something bad happening. ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, created some small booklets that they call the annexes and they run from 1 to 18. And in ICAO Annex 2, you can find lots of information on how to submit a flight plan in more detail um, if you're looking for a bit more reading. And, but in general, you should submit one in the following conditions. In Annex 2, it gives you a few more, but these are the big ones that you need to think about. So if any part of the flight is going to use an air traffic control service, you've got to use a flight plan. If it is a IFR flight, or if the flight takes place in advisory airspace, which we'll talk about in a second. If the flight crosses any international borders, so if you're going from um, France into Germany or something like that, you will have to do a flight plan. Or if the flight plan passes through a required area. So this is something maybe like an area that's close to a military uh, airfield. They want to know if you're going to be flying near there so that when an aircraft appears on radar for that military airbase, they don't shoot you down basically. They know that you're planned to be there and you're supposed to be there really. Flight plans also have to be submitted within a certain time frame. So it's not less than 30 minutes before our estimated time of departure, ideally at least 60 minutes. And for flights across the Atlantic using North Atlantic tracks, this becomes a three hour limit. The maximum limit for flight plans is 120 hours or five days before the flight. So you've got this window of about five days before up until about 30 minutes before three hours if it's NATS tracks across the Atlantic, but ideally you want to do it between five days and an hour before. If there are any delays, then air traffic control can delay the estimated departure time so that the flight plan is updated with the new information but this must be done for IFR flights if you're more than 30 minutes late or 60 minutes for a VFR flight. So you've got a little bit of a window of when you need to take off before you need to delay the flight plan officially and resubmit it basically. You don't actually resubmit it, air traffic control basically deal with the problem for you, but you have to be aware of delaying a flight plan if you are more than half an hour late for IFR flights or 60 minutes for VFR. So depending on the type of airspace you're flying in, you might need to submit a flight plan or you might not. The type of airspace can be kind of a strange concept because it's all just air, but think of it like an upside down wedding cake with the top layer of cake being on the ground at an airport and then you've got these different tiers as you go up. Each of these layers can have a different vertical range. The ground might be 2,000, that might be 3,000 and that might be 5,000 for instance. But it, and it all depends on where you are, what sort of airspace they want for that area. The air traffic control center have decided for that area. It's not a flat rule that class D airspace goes up to 3,000 feet. It's, it depends on where you are. You have to consult the charts and understand the airspace that you're going to be in. So in this di diagram 
here we've picked the five main types of airspace that we see in the UK. Other countries will have similar classifications uh, that might be slightly different, so make sure you're familiar with the airspace rules of whatever country you are flying in. Your country's air law exam should cover all the local quirks and rules and regulations. So starting off with Class A. Class A is IFR only. We don't allow VFR traffic to fly in Class A, class a airspace. We need a clearance to enter it because it's fully air traffic controlled and air traffic control will give us separation to other traffic. In this case, it's obviously gonna be only other IFR traffic and that'll keep us clear um, of whatever aircraft is in the area. They'll give us vectors or tell us to turn left, turn right, descend, climb to keep us well separated from other aircraft. And because it's a full air traffic control service that we're using, we need a flight plan to fly within Class A airspace. Class B airspace doesn't really feature that much, but Class C airspace is quite common. This is essentially Class A plus VFR. So it's full air traffic control. We've got IFR and VFR traffic. We need a clearance to enter and separation is given between all aircraft, whether it's VFR or IFR traffic. And that means that a flight plan will be required to fly within Class C airspace. Class D airspace is quite common around airports in the UK. There is IFR and VFR traffic allowed inside and clearance is required to enter into the airspace. Air traffic control provide a control service for IFR traffic and therefore will give separation between IFR and other IFR traffic and also between something called special VFR, which is another classification of VFR to fly in reduced weather conditions, which you'll learn more about in air law. Basically, if the weather's just a little bit worse, then you'd need uh, full IFR flight plans and uh, procedures to be followed. You can use this special VFR, and it's basically invented so that if you fly out of somewhere VFR, you can uh, get back home if the weather just drops a little bit. Um, but between VFR traffic and other VFR traffic, no separation is required and uh, given, but it will be required between the aircraft because it's the responsibility of the pilots. I think I said that a bit weird, but basically VFR have to keep clear of other traffic themselves. IFR have to keep, keep clear of other traffic, but ATC help them do that. IFR traffic will not be separated from VFR traffic, only IFR and special VFR, but it will be given the information such as, for your information, there's a VFR uh, aircraft crossing at this point to this point at this altitude. Then we have the information flying IFR to look out for them in that area and be like, right, that's them over there. We're nowhere near them. We're safely separated. Between VFR and VFR, they just get information on the other traffic similarly, and they have to do all the separation themselves. Because there's IFR traffic in this zone, you will need a flight plan to fly within it and cross through it, wherever you're doing, even if you're VFR. Class E airspace allows IFR and VFR traffic. It's basically controlled in the sense of uh, Class A airspace for IFR traffic. So you get full separation from other IFR traffic um, and you get information on VFR traffic that are in the area. But for VFR traffic, this is uncontrolled airspace. You get no information. Well, you can ask for information from air traffic control, but they won't provide traffic separation. You would have to ask for it specifically. So it's uncontrolled VFR, controlled IFR, a bit of a strange combo if you ask me, but that means you get clearance if you want to fly within this area in IFR because you're using an air traffic control service and you would also need a flight plan if you're flying IFR but if you're VFR this is free airspace you can fly around you don't even have to have a radio I don't think. Class G is what we call uncontrolled airspace so you can fly in it if you're IFR or VFR but you get very little help from air traffic control they'll give you maybe a basic service which is what you can use to ask for Q&H or maybe the weather information at a certain airport. 
but they won't give you any separation between aircraft. It's completely up to the responsibility of the pilots on board the aircraft. Because it's uncontrolled, it means there's no clearance to enter and there's no flight plan required. So class G, if you think about that analogy right at the start of the upside down cake, so this is your, your wedding cake here, this is the top tier, but obviously upside down, you get the, uh, the bigger tiers as you go up, and class G would fall almost, fall almost into the negative spaces in between. It's the uncontrolled bit. You can fly through that to, at your heart's content as long as you're looking out the window for other aircraft. Uh, you don't even need a radio to fly in class G, even if you're IFR. So as you're flying along and you want to enter into various airspaces or your route takes you through various airspaces, you can look at the class of airspace and figure out, right, I'm doing an IFR flight. It's going through class E, then class A, then landing in class D airspace. It's coming in this way or doing something similar. Then you think, right, I need an IFR flight plan for that section in class A. I'm still IFR, so I'll need it for class E. And then coming down into class D into this airport, yep, I'm going to have to have a flight plan for this section as well. So you'd submit a full flight plan for that whole route. So if you want to file a flight plan, you can do so manually or electronically. Obviously, electronically is going to be faster, but for some reason, if the system fails, you can manually fill one in and send it in via fax to the relevant air traffic control center. Or, yeah, fax seems wild, but that's the way they used to do it. You used to manually fill one out, put it in a fax machine, and then it would go off to air traffic control. They'd come back and say approved, or you need to correct it. If you're submitting digitally or manually, there are three main types of flight plan. You get a full flight plan, which is the standardized uh, format. So give you details on the type of flight, the plane type, the route, equipment, passengers on board, as well as many other things. And this is the sort of standard baseline type of flight plan. You get an abbreviated flight plan, which might be used when only part of the flight plan is required to have a flight plan. So say you're only briefly transiting a class D airspace where you need a flight plan then you might just want to submit a partial abbreviated flight plan for that section where you need to pass through that airspace. The good thing about an abbreviated flight plan is you can submit it over the radio or over the phone. So you can be in the middle of a flight and realize that your route passes through an area where you need a flight plan and you go call up on the radio and say, look, this is my plan that I want to submit. And they'll go, yeah, fine. You're cleared to enter the zone at this time at this point for a transit and then out the other end they'll say goodbye carry on abbreviated flight plans are good for in flight you also get a repetitive flight plan which is a automatically updating it's filed every day using the same route same aircraft much like a, a train timetable time almost it's the same thing every day same aircraft same people etc and once the flight plan is in and submitted, that is what you would then call the filed flight plan. If there are any amendments by air traffic control in the future, then you would call out your current flight plan. So say they wanted to amend our routing, they might say when you're flying, uh, we need to make some changes to your filed flight plan. Instead, go from this waypoint to this waypoint. Then you would read it back and your new current flight plan would be noted with those changes so it would be different from what you actually submitted to air traffic control. So this is what the ICAO flight plan looks like in its paper form, in digital form. These boxes will be drop down arrows or things you can type in obviously. So as you can see there's lots of boxes to fill in and they're all numbered so let's just work our way down and remember to fill things in using capital letters and all flight times are in UTC not local if you're doing this manually. So up the top, we just have general information about uh, the address it is, time of filing. And then as we go down the page, we can see that the message type is FPL, meaning full flight plan. Seven is our first box that we need to fill in. This is the call sign of the aircraft. A call sign is used to differentiate between different aircraft and it's specific to that flight. It's different from the reg of the aircraft because that doesn't change every single flight, obviously and this allows clear distinction between different flights on the same physical aircraft. If we didn't have a call sign, then we could always uh, enter the reg in here. Our call sign today is going to be class 10. Each airline will have their own code and shorthand for the call sign. 
so ours will be entered in CLS class 10. The type of flight rules we're going to use is here in section 8. It's either IFR, VFR or a combination of the two. We're going to fly IFR, so I've put in the, uh, the letter I. I'm not going to cover every single possible letter that can go into all these boxes as the videos would take way too long and take a lot of effort on my part to explain every single little thing. But if you take a look online for ICAO flight plan codes, you'll be able to see all the various letters for each box and what they mean. Next, we have the type of flight. This could be uh, general aviation or what we're doing, which is S for a scheduled service. This is a commercial flight planned well in advance that has been scheduled for a while. Again, have a look online for all the possible codes that could go into this box here. Section nine indicates the number, type, and wake turbulence category of the aircraft. So if we're doing formation flying, we would enter more than one aircraft, but if we leave it blank, it's assumed to be one. So we're not gonna fly in formation. And then the type of aircraft we're gonna fly is an Airbus A320. All planes will have a specific code that can be found easily online and entered into this box. And then next you have the wake turbulence category. This is based off the maximum certified takeoff mass of the aircraft. In our case, M stands for medium. This covers all aircraft from 7,000 to 136,000 kilograms. L would indicate it's lighter than this and H would indicate heavier. And you also get J for a super heavy A380. 10 is the equipment that we have on board the aircraft in terms of navigation, communication, and capabilities. So this section here contains a lot of codes. It's very extensive, it covers a lot. So again, look online. I'm just gonna talk about the symbols, sorry, the letters that I've put down here, um, but this is not the full list that can go on an aircraft. There's a hell of a lot more letters that can go in. So let's just go along. So S, that indicates that we've got the standard nav equipment and uh, nav and communication equipment, which means we've got a VHF, very high frequency radio, and we've also got the capabilities to follow VORs and fly an ILS. D stands for DME, so we've got the ability to track DMEs. F stands for ADF or NDB capability, and G stands for GNN GNSS, uh, GPS capabilities. So we've got navigation up until this point, we've got the standard equipment, we can do DMEs, we can do uh, NDBs, and we can fly using GPS as well. H indicates that we've got high frequency radios. So the standard is very high frequency, but high frequency basically has longer range. So we've got a high frequency radio on board our A320. I is an inertial navigation uh, system. That's basically a pretty clever bit of kit that detects your, you give it a starting position, then it detects your acceleration and time in each direction. And it'll give you a final location or a current location based off of all those little accelerations in all the directions you've got. Very clever bit of kit. Um, yeah, so uh, I for an inertial navigation system. J1 is something called CPDLC, which is uh, Controller Pilot Data Link Communications, which is essentially text messages between air traffic control and pilots. It's relatively new. R stands for PBN, which is Performance Based Navigation, which is basically the ability to use the GNSS, GPS signals, and other signals from the ground accurately enough to fly within certain tolerances. W stands for RVSM, reduce vertical separation minima, which means we can reduce the vertical separation above certain flight levels to only a thousand feet between aircraft either above or below us. Y stands for VHF radio with 8.33 kilohertz spacing between them. Basically, more up-to-date, more accurate radios. We can use more frequencies and Z is for any other equipment that will be detailed in section 18. This is usually the type of PBN operations which the aircraft is capable, that symbol R. So R says PBN, but PBN has different ratings. 
So we've written down Z to say we'll give more information on what PBN we can do. And then after the slash here, we put in the transponder mode we have available. In our case, L indicates mode S, which includes aircraft identification, pressure altitude, and enhanced surveillance capability. It basically means that uh, air traffic control can see us on radar pretty well. So the equipment's quite a big one. Uh, there's a lot of codes flying about, a lot of information I've just thrown at you, PBN, RVSM, uh, CPDLC, all these acronyms. This is um, quite an important section because if they tell you to fly to a certain place where you need HF radio, um, but you don't have it, then you can say, then you, you've told them ahead of time, basically. You've said, we don't have a uh, high frequency radio, so we can't fly into that airspace that needs a high frequency radio. And hopefully they won't give it to you. 13 is the departure aerodrome in the standard four letter ICAO identifier and the time that we plan to leave it in UTC here. So LGKO is COS in Greece. Then we go down to our cruising speed. In our case, it's going to be Mach 0.77. It could also be an N at the start for knots or a K for kilometers per hour. And we're going to flight level 320. This could be A for altitude as well. There's a few different letters that can go at the front. Then we have our route, including our standard instrument departure, and at the end, our standard terminal arrival. A few things to know about this. This is just various waypoints. So you've got the Larky 3 Alpha to Larky. Then between each waypoint, there should either be uh, airway, this one uniformly must 609, or you can see DCT, which means direct. So you're not flying along an airway, you're just cutting the corner maybe, flying directly from Eveli to Okana. And then you can see here, at this point, Sasal, we've got a slash and max 0.77 written again, and flight level 360. So whenever we have altitude or speed uh, changes that are significant, we put a slash and write in the new speed and level so the air traffic control know, hey, we want to climb at Sasal to flight level 360 from flight level 320. And then we carry on our route all the way to Agped 1 Echo, which is the star for Edinburgh, which is number 16. And instead of putting our estimated time of arrival in here, we put our total elapsed en route time, EET, basically the amount of time we're gonna be flying for. So we estimate that that route it's gonna take us four hours and four minutes. And we do that instead of a standard uh, arrival time because if we're delayed by 10 minutes, then they can add the four hours and four on and get a more accurate time of our arrival instead of just going, oh, they said they were gonna arrive at, what, about uh, 12, 24, and having to update everything after that. They can just look at our takeoff time, add four hours four and go, right, that's the time we expect to see them in Edinburgh. Then after that, we have our primary and secondary alternates. You sometimes might not have a secondary, but for the conditions today, we required a second alternate. And then in section 18, you add a lot of other information. This can be regarding loads of stuff. There's quite a lot of three letter uh, preface codes that will indicate what we're talking about. So it could be COM, COM for communications, NAV, for any additional navigation, or in our case, PBN indicates our uh, PBN capability that we stipulated in the equipment. We said we had R for PPN, and then we said we're gonna write more about it in section 18 with the letter Z indicated there. So there's quite a lot going on here, A1, B1, C1, D1, 01, and S2. Basically means we've got a lot of capability in terms of performance-based navigation. And performance-based navigation is always measured in how accurate we can be for more than 95% of the time. So for instance, A1 indicates that for more than 95% of the time, we can be accurate to within 10 nautical miles. And then B1 is, I think, five, C1's three, D1's two, I can't remember the exact numbers, but zero, 01, meaning we can go down to one nautical mile accuracy at least 95% of the time. And then S2 indicates that we can fly PBN-based approaches, 
but only if we use the altimeter barometric altitude rather than any GPS altitudes. This might all mean absolutely nothing to you at the moment, but at some point it will make sense, probably after you've studied radio navigation and uh, aircraft general knowledge. Then in section 19, we fill out all the search and rescue inf search and rescue information, including the endurance based on the amount of fuel that we plan to load on board, the amount of people on board, that's passengers and crew, what sort of emergency radio we've got, what sort of survival equipment we've got, jack uh, life jackets if we've got any, dinghies or life rafts if we've got any, the colour of the plane, any additional remarks and the pilot in command. Then you've completed that flight plan and you would submit it and would it be given to the relevant air traffic control authorities for your route. And if lots of flight plans were submitted and passed through the same airspace, air traffic control might delay your flight plan in the form of a slot restriction, which in the summer months in Europe are the cause of so much pain and delays and me sitting twiddling my thumbs looking at my phone whilst waiting to take off. Basically what happens is air traffic control basically say there's too many of you coming through this bit of airspace at this time for it to be safe. This could be based off of how many uh, air traffic controllers they have and how many uh, planes they can safely coordinate at once, things like that. But they'll say, right, instead of you all coming through here at the same time, we'll delay you by 10 minutes, you by 20 minutes, and you by 30 minutes, so you don't all fly and arrive at this point at once. Then the aircraft will depart according to that new slot, which is sometimes called a CTOT, which is calculated takeoff time. And that way there's no congestion in the air where we're burning fuel, running out of fuel, that kind of thing. But it does, however, mean that we have to sit on the ground at the airport waiting around to take off, usually at the stand. That's it for flight planning. Um, I'm going to film a little study session to revise before doing a live stream mock exam thing. And then it's on to the next subject. I'll put a vote up um, as I've done in the past, but it's most likely going to be radio navigation or aircraft general knowledge based off of the previous votes that have gone ahead.